Hi guys, and welcome back to our Inside AMG F1 special. Now, if you've seen part one already, you know that we had way too much great footage for just one video. If you haven't seen part one yet, make sure you check it out. But now let's jump right into part two. Have fun. Hello. Uh, I was told I was gonna meet somebody here. Um, where exactly are we? This is the Faye shop. Ah, nice. That's and interesting. I'm Faye. You're Faye? Yeah. Nice. Yeah, come on in. I see a lot of paint guns. I see a lot of different logos, Mercedes stars in different shapes. Nice. Yeah. What is it that you do here actually? Well today we're teaching how to do the Mercedes star, but we do lots of paintwork on the F1 car, the AMG projects and other different customer work too. So you're actually a dedicated spray paint, paint shop yeah. artist yeah. working for the Formula One team. Custom paint, yep. Yeah. That is crazy. I had no idea that a position like that existed at the team. Yeah, it's one of those sorts of jobs. That's how you paint the Mercedes star. It's actually yeah. paintbrushed on the car. Yeah, I could even teach you. You could? Yeah. Awesome, awesome. I mean, that looks very complicated, I have to say. I always thought it was just a sticker that was put on the car. No, a lot of people think that. But there's a lot of work that goes into making sure the car is smooth. So the less stickers we have on it, the better. Wow, that, I mean, that's just precision in every little last detail. I had no idea you did that. You said you could teach me one or two things? Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, we get that's it on? Fit. Awesome. Yeah. I'm guessing I'm a little less experienced than, than him. I can, I can feel the pressure rising already, okay. I mean, I see Let's there's different this. steps that are described yeah. here. How many steps are there that go into painting? Uh, I think these? 73, let me check. 73 Hang different on. steps. Hang on a minute. Yep, 73. Wow, that's okay. That's the finished article there. Here we go. Now, if we apply paint mask number two, which is this one. Uh-huh. Straight over the top of that. And it needs to be dead center. Yeah. Okay, that's gonna be exciting. So you need to hover it over. Uh-huh. Get it lined up at the top. That's my best tip for you. Okay. Do that bit first. Keep lining it up as you go. Keep adjusting the whole okay. time. I'll align it here. Not sure if I made a good job. That's a good first attempt. Okay. That's a really, really good effort. Somebody who's never done this before. Woo! <laughs> and there it is. There's a straight edge. My really precise tooling. <laughs> I'm gonna hold this here. You're gonna press down on this trigger. Be it air. Okay. See, no paint's coming out. Then when you pull back, get paint. Ah, yeah? okay. Very slightly. While pressing down, I pull it back. Yeah. Sounds simple, but it's quite a tricky thing to master. Do a line straight up there. Bingo. Look at that, first line. Wow. I'm gonna unclip you. How many have you already done? What would At you reckon? At least a thousand. Really? Yeah. Been doing these for, I think, 12 seasons. And we counted one year that we painted about 90 noses. And then you do other ones on other things as well. So yeah, I've easily done a thousand. <laughs> so this time, I want you to just do a nice stroke along the bottom edge of okay. this spear there. Like that? Yeah, you're done. Awesome. That is so cool. But it's crazy to think like over 70 steps go into painting one star. It takes us half an hour to do an F1 nose star. Half an hour? That is super quick. I think I saw some AMG1 uh, parts out there, so that's probably one of the one of the cars you're working on here. Yeah, right now that's what we're focusing on. That is super awesome. Thank you so much for teaching me these tricks. That's all right. Come back I'll, anytime. I think I'll uh, get back uh, out of this mask. <laughs> Super awesome. Thank you very much. That's um, I think it's time for me to head on, get back to Kate. And thank you very much for showing me around. The next very cool display piece you got here. Yeah, so we are here in the Silver Arrows Lounge, which is our guest hosting space where we host AMG, MB, customers, partners, um, you name it. 
It's the same setup that we also have at the track for VIP guest hosting. Um, we have James Ellison here with us, our chief technical officer, there he who's is. happy to answer some nice of your you. questions right. you might have. Nice to meet you too, Take the man away. himself. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for uh, taking the time uh, to be here in this video with us today. Oh, it's a total pleasure, total pleasure. Um, of course, uh, I mean, I got millions of questions, but why don't we start out? I mean, most people probably recognize you and already know you, but why don't you tell the people what it is that you do? at the Formula One team here. Hi, hi, my name's James Allison and I'm the Chief Technology Officer for this team. Uh, until relatively recently I was the Technical Director but handed over that role to Mike Elliott and now I'm the Chief uh, Technology Officer. And what that means is that uh, basically I do the things that the Technical Director doesn't have time to do. <laughs> uh, being a technical director is an impossibly wide brief. You're supposed to be responsible for how well the car is going in the racing season. You're supposed to be responsible for the next one, for the next year. And while doing that, that's already an impossibly big job. You're also supposed to be looking over the horizon, seeing what's coming towards the team and preparing the team for that. And generally speaking, even the most amazingly bandwidth technical directors struggle to look too far over the horizon because the call of the present day is so loud and so pressing. And this new role of Chief Technology Officer for the, for the team allows me the luxury of being more f sort of forward-looking for the team, trying to see what threats and opportunities might be coming down the rails at us and hopefully positioning things so that the technical director who's got his head in the current car and the future car has got a, a better sort of uh, set of tools coming his way for dealing with that. Sounds like it makes a lot of sense. I mean, I've already caught a glimpse of all the different, well, pieces and all the different brains that come together to create something like this. I mean, this is another car that's actually been on the racetrack, the 2021 car, another 2020 car this is actually. Um, do you know where this where this one raced? I, I don't. It will have done many. I mean, it's, it's Lewis's car. Um, it will have done a good chunk of the season. Yeah. I don't, honestly, I don't often get sentimental about cars, but the 2020 car was such a peach yeah. that it's hard, hard not to have anything but affection for this one. It was really a tremendously good car, one of the all-time great F1 cars. And, and pretty cool to see it here with, with some battle scars already and, and just to imagine how much effort it takes to put something like that together and think about the future that really, yeah, uh, uh, makes one wonder how, well, what drives you to pursue a career like that in the first place? I mean, it's immensely stressful. Uh, well, it is stressful, but it is a brilliant alternative to working. <laughs> and uh, and I, I was an engineer at university. Um, faced with uh, trying to find a role in engineering and and I you know there's a huge range of things you can do as with an engineering degree but uh, I, I wanted to do something that that really uh, lit me up and mm. I was always such a fan of F1 as a boy and the idea that I could maybe ply my trade in F1 doing something that was as exciting as that and maybe earn some money from it was was too good to resist and I was uh, lucky, lucky, because uh, there is a lot of luck involved, that when I wrote my initial round of application letters to every single Formula One team, that I got one reply. <laughs> and, uh, really? Yeah, one reply. And uh, very lucky that that led to, a, to me getting a role in, in a team and then having the most brilliantly enjoyable career thereafter. And how long ago was that? That was 1991, so ancient history wow. by most standards, but feels like yesterday to me. Crazy, and, and to see some of the memor memorabilia that you have here and, and the trophies as well, I mean, this, the success speaks for itself. Uh, uh, this team has been remarkable. These, these trophies are only a subset of the trophies <laughs> we've won. There isn't enough space. Yeah. In fact, um, one of my more memorable things in this team was Pre-COVID, uh, the last Christmas party we had in 2019, they lined up every piece of silverware that we wow. have uh, won over the consecutive seasons that we managed to get the championships and completely unexpectedly revealed it with a sort of big flash and a curtain coming down and lights coming on and just this massive array of glittering silverware. It made you think, blimey, we did that. And so cool. uh, it's quite staggering when you look at it and you know how hard it is to win a single race. Mm -hmm. And then you see that 
sort of almost wall to wall. We can take a look over here at some of the stuff that's on display here. I mean, here I see Lewis Iscari is here, Lewis suit is here. Yeah. That looks like something a little bit older. Michael that's Michael. Schumacher. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it's what amazing he's just sitting up here in this room. It speaks volumes for the honesty of everyone here, because he just sits here, <laughs> sits here unguarded. And nice. uh, that's quite a precious piece of uh, material. Um, yeah. Wow, it makes you really like very oh, emotional thinking about all the different people that were involved in the successes of this team. Oh, the steering wheel, well, this looks like it's been a few years, it's a few years older probably than yeah. today's wheels. Yeah, yeah that's uh, it's not, not a current one, but even, even back then you can see uh, that's a busy piece of hardware on the mm -hmm. car that allows the driver a lot of input into the vehicle, trying to manage both the performance of the car and actually a lot of the reliability of the mm -hmm. car, because by rule, by rule, we're not allowed to send signals to the car to tune it mm. uh, or to help rescue it. Mm -hmm. um, so, so the driver is uh, is is quite often having to tell the car, ignore that sensor. Mm -hmm. It's telling you fibs, um, <laughs> and then the car, once it knows to ignore that sensor, it will automatically default into a safer mode. Mm -hmm. um, but the driver, while going around the track in human speeds is busy fiddling with those switches to select one of, of many, many hundreds of sensors to say, no, that sensor, ignore it. And uh, it's quite impressive that they have the bandwidth to do that. I got a little taster of that today because I was lucky enough to take a step into your simulator you have yeah. here at the facilities and with a, a little more of a modern steering wheel or a little more recent steering wheel. And I just have to say, it was just so overwhelming seeing all those, those switches and stuff and imagining how, well, your drivers engage with all of that and drive a car at a race pace uh, I well probably not surprisingly I couldn't do it um, no yeah I think I, sometimes I feel sorry for racing car drivers because they're like unlike any other sportsman I think everyone who watches someone running a you know a sub four minute mile knows that there's no way on on god's green earth that they could do that it's you know there's only a tiny proportion of humanity yeah. that can do that and watch someone playing tennis or watch any of top sportsmen and, and i think people afford to them the the uh, respect that their skill deserves because they know they couldn't yeah. do it but most this is more a problem of for guys than girls, I think. But most blokes think, oh, I could do that. <laughs> All I needed to do is, you know, have a bit of training. I, I could be pretty quick. And, but no chance, not, not even the beginning of a chance that could you be anywhere close to what these top, top drivers are capable of. Uh, both physically, the, you know, the, the skill in their hands and feet, and also mentally, the, the, the amount that they're able to process and remember uh, about what they're doing is incredible. They come back in and debrief us after a run and they can tell us, not corner by corner, but phase of corner by phase of corner, what happened lap after lap um, because they are so specialized at that one task. It's just superhuman. And I got to confess, I myself stepped into that simulator and I was like, how hard can it be? And I've spent <laughs> so many hours in front of the TV screen playing on my console. And once I, I sat in that, well, it can only be described as a very narrow bathtub, yeah. uh, it all just went away. <laughs> yeah. no, it's, it's super awesome. It's very specialized. Yeah. And how does that, all that simulator work help you for the development of, of the car and for the race weekends? It helps us in many ways, but it's probably easiest to think of it in short and long term. So in the short term, it helps us because that tool with the, with the drivers sitting in that machine uh, are able to give us specific setup clues mm. about how to get the most out of a given track with the given car. So we can run through all different setup parameters, we can run through uh, different driving lines, we can run through different energy burning profiles, all sorts of of, of ways of trying to seek lap time out, and we can get a, a, a quantitative result back from the simulator about which is quicker and which is slower. And the correlation between those suggestions and reality is really quite good. Mm -hmm. So it helps us weekend by weekend prepare for a race uh, week. Um, it also helps us actually through the weekend because they, they're working during the race weekend itself between the sessions. But perhaps the role that is less commonly understood is the more powerful one, and that is it helps us from year to year mm -hmm. with the car. Because if, if we want to uh, examine uh, a, a new design direction for the car, we can do that 
in simulation which doesn't involve humans, I, a sort of desktop simulation mm -hmm. where it's a computer driving the car, and we can find out by sweeping all sorts of different parameters what looks promising and what doesn't look promising for a, a lap time point of view. But the computer will never really drive it like mm -hmm. a human can. Yeah. And so we need to close the loop. So that will give us a bunch of clues about what looks like a promising direction. But in order to close the loop on that and commit expensive hardware to reality, we need to actually get a human involved. The sport doesn't let us test on a track. So this is really the only thing we can do and the best thing we can do to actually get the real limitations of a real person into the loop of what makes a car go quicker. And so it helps us choose the design direction yeah. for the car and helps us uh, develop uh, much quicker than we could ever do um, in its absence. Fascinating also, especially when considering how back in the day it must have worked before simulations were a thing and all you had was the very limited test time you got. Just crazy. Well, I mean, back in the day you got a lot of test time because well, it, it yeah, wasn't no. restricted. It was restricted <laughs> by your wallet yeah. uh, and, uh, and it got pretty expensive. But, um, but it was also as a result of it being very empirical, mm -hmm. sort of uh, go out on the track, change something, see what happens, <laughs> look at the stopwatch. It was much less scientific. Mm -hmm. uh, so not only was it very expensive, but it also didn't involve a proper examination of the physics of the car. Mm -hmm. And the fact that we're not able to test on a track has forced us to really create uh, digital twin models of the real car mm -hmm. that are a pretty good representations of reality and therefore allow us to, to make the car quicker. And so um, actually not being allowed to test on a track actually has moved forward the understanding of racing cars quite a lot. So at the end it was probably a good decision to regulate the, the testing time that was available. Uh, yeah, weirdly, yeah. weirdly, quite often yeah. uh, some of the biggest sort of technical innovations have been a response to Uh, a limitation imposed by a regulation because yeah. you thought you were doing a good job beforehand then someone takes away your ability to work in that way and you think well okay we can't just give up and, mm. and not make the car quicker and it forces you to think more carefully and actually you end up more efficient and better at it than you were previously which is annoying because that was always available to you all <laughs> along but it was the external stimulus yeah. that forced you to do that it's probably a bit of a problem with humans that they they respond well to being hit on the head mm -hmm. um, <laughs> they fight back against it and you described it as a scientific approach and scientific i think describes it very well also when uh, i think back to all the the things i saw today with the very squeaky clean facilities and always lab-like and, and thinking well of the cars themselves actually and how they are designed and every square inch you see on there and every angle everything is scientifically tested and, and nothing's there without a reason and yeah. uh, no and it, it it really just can't be because it's a very small space to pack mm -hmm. an awful lot of stuff into and every every square millimeter has to pay for itself yeah. in performance and uh, and And we do, we do pour a lot of effort into trying to make that as good as it possibly can be. What are the major challenges you would say you're facing at the moment and uh, in current season, of course, and also facing yeah. the future with the regulation change going on this year? Well, um, I think probably the biggest one is obvious to anyone who's a fan of the sport, and that is that this generation of cars in 2022, big regulation change. And many of the aspects of that regulation change were well understood, well well dealt with, well optimized for, but something that caught more or less everybody by surprise was the emergence of this effect of called porpoising, mm -hmm. porpoising where the cars are bucking and bouncing as mm -hmm. they as they go down the straights and also through the corners. And that That is a, a, a sort of uh, like a bear trap that was in the regulations um, that, uh, that none of us really saw coming. And, uh, and it's, it's fallen, you know, different teams have fallen into that trap in, in, with different levels mm -hmm. of severity. We, we fell into it pretty badly. And, uh, and, and that has forced us to address the fact that our pre previous methodology for uh, designing a car was blind to this particular problem. Mm -hmm. And so it's forced us to actually revise quite sharply 
the way in which we uh, assess the forces generated on the car, um, bringing into the, into the equation uh, terms that we'd previously considered to be second or third order terms, mm -hmm. which on this generation of car ten, are actually first order terms. Mm -hmm. It's forced us to bring them in, create methodologies that make them visible, and then engineer them out of the picture. And that has been uh, both a deeply frustrating start to the season, but also if you're an engineer, a brilliantly interesting start to the season because, <laughs> because it's been a very deep and complicated challenge, but one that we are starting to get to grips with now and our competitiveness returning as we, as we have sort of started to master the physics that is driving that purpose. Very fascinating to watch also as a spectator and of course you yourself and the team you're no people to shy away from challenges like that. And, no, absolutely yeah. not. You, you know, you've got to just face the fact that yeah. that aspect of the car we got wrong. You take your licks, but then go fix it. And then, uh, and then come back and show, show everyone that we're not bad at ranking racing cars. Can't wait to see that. Yeah. Best of luck for that. And thank you. Thank, you, thank you very much for taking the time. It's a total pleasure. Thank, thank you. you. Honestly, I could have talked to James for another three to four hours. That was super interesting. Yeah, I know, right? So as your final stop, we have a very special treat for you. We have uh, saved you a spot in the RSR, our race support room, uh, where you will be watching the next track session. I will hand over to Stefan, one of our race strategy engineers. And nice I hope you. you Nice to meet you too. Awesome, thank you. So the RSR, the race support room, what is that even? Well, the RSR is our like ground control, like similar to the mission control room at NASA. Mm -hmm. We have a direct connection to the track. All the data is coming live to us, um, even from the f track uh, furthest away. It's mm -hmm. just a couple of seconds. And we look at the data, we analyze it. We have basically every engineer that's at the track has support in the RSR as well. So there are electronics engineers, there are tire engineers, there's us in, in race strategy, and we try to support um, the workforce at the track as good as we can. That is crazy. I had no idea you had a whole mission control set up here in Brackley as well. Yeah. You, s you said you're in race strategy. What is your, your background? How does one end up in, in a <laughs> job like that? So my background is uh, general yep, mechanical engineering, mm -hmm. and I started here in the team as a graduate on a rotational scheme, so I've seen different parts of the business, and then after two years ended up in, in race strategy in a permanent role. That is so cool. but. Like you said, every like every kind of engineer has a counterpart that's here and not at the racetrack. Yeah. Why do you do that? Is it just because there's not enough space there, or? Yeah. So um, at the track, there's limited space. Mm -hmm. Obviously, like especially in tracks like Monaco, for example, oh, everything yeah. is super tightly packed. Um, but here, the fact that we have support, uh, we have more resource available. We can use our powerful computers. We have more screens. Um, so there are roles that are just more suited mm -hmm. to being at the factory here in the race support room than being at the track. Awesome, super cool. Can we take a look inside? Of course, come in. Nice. Wow. Really, this is as top secret as it gets. I'm actually sitting inside the race support room right now during pre-practice and it's just this wall of information that's in front of me. Unfortunately, we can't show you any of this, but like Stefan said, all these engineers are responsible for keeping the operation running during practice, during qualifying, during the race. I've got three screens in front of me. I've got a live feed directly from the track. Signals from the track arrive here in under one second. I've got the live leaderboard right in front of me. I've got all these different signals and, and messages. I don't even know what some of them mean. And I, I got a complete switchboard in front of me. I could talk to, well, pretty much anybody <laughs> on track right now. I got two buttons right in front of me saying George and Lewis. I wonder what would happen if I pressed one of those and talked into the mic right now. This is super exciting. Awesome. I can't believe how privileged I am to be sitting here right now. Like this is, this is really what I imagined it to be like when Stefan said this is like mission control. I mean, there is all these screens in front of me. There is this huge wall with the live map of the track. I can see little, um, I can see the pictures of the transmitters of every driver that's on track right now, including a live timing. Yeah. I got a live weather map that's showing the area around the racetrack, humidity, um, a little weather forecast with cloud formations moving. 
We also got live camera feeds from the pit, from the track, showing each of the garage. I've got one camera facing Lewis's garage, one camera facing George's garage. As this is just, just unbelievable amounts of information that you have to digest. And now I really, I really understand why, well, the yeah. people that are at the track, that's yeah. just not enough. You yeah. need to have more backup people here and to make the best of it and, and ensure that, yeah, you get the best performance out of the car, the team, the whole package. This is, this is really very, very impressive. <laughs> All right, both Lewis and George have gotten a couple laps in. They're both out on the track right now. I keep listening to all the banter that is going on on the radio. It's crazy, like people talking back and forth on every channel. Just crazy amount. We need to keep it down because they're communicating live as we speak with the drivers. They give feedback on how the cars feel. So the engineers here can then digest that information and the, gen the engineers on track can modify the cars accordingly. So to make sure that in qualifying, we get the best possible lap times. And so far it's looking pretty good. You can actually feel the level of concentration right now. Everybody is just super focused right now to get the most out of this practice session. And you can hear how straining it is for the drivers when they talk and trying to keep the car between the walls at the same time. We're deep into the practice session now and it's getting really crowded on track. Almost every car is on the circuit at the moment. Like for a lifelong Formula One fan like me, this is just beyond belief. Like to be this close to the action without actually being at the track, but to be really in it, inside the action and all the strategy and stuff, seeing this firsthand and hearing it, that's just as good as it gets. So, Felix, how was it to be one of the very few people that get to enjoy a track session from within our race support room? That was so cool and I feel extremely privileged. I mean, just the sheer amount of information you need to take in and digest and, well, I mean, I got a very good understanding now why you need such a, well, a large group of people to make the success possible. That was really cool. Thank you, Stefan, for making this possible. You're so welcome. Very cool. So I said this would be our final stop, but uh, you actually have the opportunity to go to HPP to learn more about our power unit. Um, so your journey actually doesn't end here. They're expecting you over at Brixworth um, if you want to go. <laughs> Absolutely, yes, okay. nice. Thank you. No wow. Rep. Absolutely cool. Thank you. Pleasure. <laughs> nice. And also thank you for showing us around here today and, and taking the time. That was really cool. Absolutely. Cool You're always welcome. Thank you very much. <laughs> See you next time. See, See you, you soon. <laughs> so there you have it. An action packed day here at Brackley comes to an end with the Mercedes AMG Petronas Formula One team. But this was only the first half because tomorrow we're going to go to Bricksworth to Mercedes AMG high performance powertrains. So yeah, we also got a lot to look forward to then. Stick around for that. And if you liked what you've seen today, drop us a comment down below, like the video, subscribe to our channel, hit the bell icon, the usual stuff. And uh, yeah, I'll see you in part two. Bye bye.